Hey there, Aspire Leaders. I'm thrilled to have you join me for this wonderful bonus episode featuring none other than Darren Peppard from the renowned Learning Into Leadership podcast. As we journey through this bonus episode, I want to express my sincere gratitude for your unwavering support. From the very beginning of the show, my mission has always been to create something dedicated to addressing your leadership questions and concerns. That's where the idea of the Aspire mailbag was born, which was again, created directly for your needs. And today, together with the wonderful Darren Pepper, we're going to recreate something very similar, but more of a roundtable discussion. We've gathered a group of pressing questions from brand new leaders, and we're going to embark on these thought-provoking topics as we dive into a lot of different practices, resources, and prior experiences that we've had. So without further ado, let's dive into this discussion as we prepare for a brand new year, and we're super excited to help in any way possible. Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire to Lead, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua Dub underscore Stamper. All right, we are on, and this is... Joshua Stamper from the Aspire to Lead podcast, and I have Darren Pepper with me with the Learning and Deletion podcast, and we're doing a collaboration, and I am so excited. <laughs> Darren, thank you so much for getting together with me today. Yeah, man, this is this is really exciting. Uh, the first time I've had an opportunity to do something like this, and and definitely, you know, bringing Aspire to Lead and Leaning into Leadership together. Uh, man, two cool platforms, and you know, definitely an opportunity for you know people that that typically listen to my show to listen to you, and vice versa. Although. They should be listening to both anyway, but you know, now, (laughs) now they can just pick, you know, Hey, I can listen to this episode, you know, on Josh's show or on, on Darren's show. This is going to be really cool. And and you know what I, what I love about, you know, putting this particular collaboration together is, you know, we're in the month of August, you know, schools are, are getting started. You know, uh, I got a text this morning from a good friend who said, man, you know, my entire staff is coming back today. I'm so excited. And, you know, as a school leader, you know, th- those days were so cool. I, I, I talk about it all the time, you know, that I miss the first day of school. But that first day back with staff is super cool. But we've got, we've got of course, across the country, a lot of new people who, you know, are, are stepping into that leadership role, whether that's a building principal or a superintendent, assistant principal, whatever, for the very first time this fall. So, yeah, I think that's where the conversation begins is, you know, both of us, we travel around the United States and we speak with school leaders all the time. There are so many brand new leaders this summer and they're starting off and they're kicking things off. They have a lot of questions in regards to what their role is and they just want some advice. And so, you know, I love this idea that you brought up was, you know, collaborating together to answer some questions from some aspiring new leaders that are getting into some different roles, either assistant principal, principal, or maybe a district role also. So we have reached out to our audience members and and just asked for questions. And so I'm looking at a list of like 20 different questions that people threw at us. And I would love to answer all of them. I know you would too, but we chose about five or six of them to focus on ones that we thought were really important and something that, you know, would be beneficial for them to hear some advice prior to starting their role. Yeah, for sure. You know, and and it was interesting too, because when you look through all of these questions, there are some real common themes. So I think we've done a nice job of picking out that five or six or so that kind of encapsulate those, those specific themes that hopefully those who are in those those new leadership roles can really dial in on those. And t- let's be honest, folks, uh, maybe you've been doing this for 25 years as a school leader or, or for five years or 10 years or whatever. We all can use sometimes a little bit of that recharge and, and that uh, re-energizing. So, so let's do this. Let's go ahead and dive in. The first question, I'll go yeah. ahead and ask the question. We're going to both talk about it. And then we're just, Perfect. yeah, we're just going to play a little tennis across the net here with some questions. So the first question that we want to get into today is how do you navigate building positive relationships with staff while at the same time enforcing your expectations? And man, I love this question. I'll, I'll let you go ahead and go first with uh, with what your thoughts are. But this is such a good question. Yeah, I was laughing because this is something that it took a long time to kind of find that balance because it's true. You're, you're wanting to make sure that you are going through 
with either students, with, with your staff to enforce those expectations, the things that need to be accountable for. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you're building a relationship with them and, and letting them know that you care for them and that you want the best for them. And I think that's the thing that you have to really work on, especially as a brand new leader. I, I remember as a dean of students and assistant principal when I first started on two different campuses, you know, I'd walk into a room and you know, the teacher would be at their desk and they'd jump up immediately and walk around and act like they were doing something important. And it's like, no, you don't need to do that. That's, that's not why I'm here. It's not a gotcha moment. And it really took some time to build that relationship. So they understood that I wasn't there just to come down on them or to be the enforcer. And, and it's the same with the students. You know, when, when I first was in those roles, I'd come into a room and everyone would be like, Ooh, who are you here for? Who, who, who are right, you uh, yeah. getting in trouble now? Right. And, and I had to slowly change that perception of like, no, I'm here because, you know, I'm, I wanted to engage with the class or I want to, you know, co-teach with this teacher, or I'm just here to, you know, check in on them and, and see how they're doing. So for myself, I always laugh that, um, I, I love spreadsheets. I know that's probably something that people are probably turning off right now, uh, uh, or blazing. <laughs> don't go away, please, eyes. please people don't go away. Yeah. But the spreadsheet was for what I called, um, my relationship walks. And so, you know, we always did walkthroughs for the academic piece and to make sure that we got data for, you know, teaching practices. But I also wanted to have something to record so that I knew my touch points, like, have I touched in with this person to see how they're doing in their own personal life? Is there something else going on beyond the school building that we can be a resource for, you know, or maybe it's just a listening ear, maybe they're just feeling stressed, and they just need to, to vent a little bit, right. Um, so, you know, with those with that spreadsheet, I was at least able to say, Okay, I haven't I haven't seen this person, I haven't had a conversation about life for three weeks, like this is this is not acceptable as for for myself as a leader. So I need to make sure that I go and, and make a point to have a five minute conversation, just ask them how they're doing you know, what's going on in their life beyond the class. And so I found that that for myself actually helped quite a bit because it did break down that, that wall, that barrier, because they knew that I was there as an authentic person trying to understand their world and how I could better it, not just coming in to say, oh, I'm going to catch you in a moment so I can write you up, right? Or get rid of you, you know, and unfortunately, for so many teachers, you know, they have had a leader like that, where they've had a negative experience, and they, they build those walls to protect themselves, so that they don't want to share anything, they, they don't want to bother you, they, they want to just be in a classroom by themselves, um, and not you know, have a interaction with the leader. And, and so for myself, I just want to be very intentional of going in and making sure that every time I had an interaction with someone, it was it was positive, and something where they wanted to come back to. Yeah, I like that a lot. I really like the phrase, um, you know, relationship walks, uh, you know, for me, what I would do uh, in a very similar fashion, um, not with a spreadsheet, though, for me, it was just more use of my calendar. Um, I would intentionally put time on my calendar for going to see staff, but go see staff when they don't have kids in the classroom. I, I think this is a big deal. You know, you talked about walkthroughs and walkthroughs are a big deal and everybody, you know, wants to see them done and they want to see the data on, you know, what they're doing or people ask, you know, I, I get this question all the time, you know, working with, with districts all over the country, like, you know, what type of feedback should we be giving them and how quickly do we need to give the feedback? And all of that is really important, but that's not the point of this particular part of the conversation. The point here is you've got to build those relationships and you know what? Set time aside to go see your teachers when they don't have kids and don't go consume their whole prep hour. Let's, let's not get carried away unless the conversation goes in that direction and they feel like they want you to be a part of that, you know, or they're opening that conversation up. But um, I would literally do that. I would put on like on a Sunday afternoon, you know, sitting watching football or whatever um, on my calendar as I was planning my week, um, I would put, you know, go see, you know, fourth period teachers with prep, you know, and I would just, you know, a couple of days that week, you know, and maybe I'd also, you know, put in another, you know, sixth hour or something like that, just just so I could always make sure I was able to get in, just check in, you know, how you doing? Um, you know, what, what you talked about, just to start your answer with this, um, to me, it's all about trust. You know, when, when, when you walk in the room and a teacher jumps up or is like, oh my gosh, or whatever. You know, I, I remember when we first started our walkthrough protocols, when uh, at the time I was an assistant principal, um, 
<laughs> you'd walk in the room and, and, you know, I called it the hiccup, you know, teacher would be teaching or something and we'd walk in and they'd be like, just have this like little, hes- you know, hesitation, this little stutter um, because they're not used to it. You know, obviously you want to build that trust. And I think trust can be built in a number of ways. And this is why I love this question so much. You talked about you've got to really communicate your expectations, but really communicating them doesn't mean on the first day staff meeting that you cover them. Yeah, do that. But you've got to talk about it repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. And it isn't just about the talk. It's about the follow through, because what a lot of staff know is what a lot of other staff are doing. And if there are ways that, you know, people are falling short of the mark They don't need to be involved in the nitty gritty. They don't need to know that you've been in having a conversation or holding somebody to or reinforcing an expectation. But word travels quick, you know, and if if they see that that transition, that change in somebody to coming up to the bar, then it's clear that you as the leader are following through. I think that's a huge part of trust that gets overlooked. You know, it's you don't have to be their friend. Um, I heard it said once, Josh, it was actually the principal that hired me to be an assistant principal. Um, Randy used to say it all the time, you know, you don't get to be one of them, but you can be one with them. You know, there's a big difference there, right? So I I love this question on relationships, and I know I could riff on this one for probably an hour. (laughs) I've probably already overused my time on on this particular question, but uh, I I think it's, it's huge, right? Yeah, it's so it's so huge. It's it's everything really as an administrator. I mean, your touch points, you know, with your students, with your parents, with your teachers. I mean, the biggest skill that you need to develop as a young leader is your communication. That's that's the key piece because you are discussing so many things with so many people on a daily basis in your decision making too. Like you make a thousand decisions a day that are extremely important. Yeah, easily. So you better be able to communicate, you know, in, in that process. So yeah, communication, building relationships is, is key for any new leader, really any leader in general. But uh, I think, you know, when someone's thinking about their early stages of, of leadership, this is where you need to start for sure. Absolutely. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. You ready for the second question here? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, I love this question. So this was actually on books. So they were asking for our new leaders, what's the most important book for you that you read in your new role? And I can I can vividly remember a book being given to me, but I wanted to ask you, you know, was there a book that you read on your own or was it in a program or did a mentor give you something? You know, that's so interesting. Yeah, we talked about this before we even hit record and I've had time to think. And, you know, just just across here to the left of me uh, is one of my one of my many bookcases. And um, I've got two full shelves that are just pure leadership books. And I'm seeing. I'm seeing books like Leverage Leadership, and I'm seeing, you know, uh, books like uh, Culturize, The Energy Bus, uh, Focus by Mike Schmoker. I mean, there's so many really, really good ones. I'll tell you that to me, the one that I thought was the most critical and that I've gone back to over and over and over, and it's not specifically a leadership book, and it's definitely not specifically an education book. But uh, John Gordon's Energy Bus. Energy Bus is one that will always stand out to me. And and the reason for that is the way that it's written, the way that, you know, it's focusing on how I as an individual choose to show up every day, how I choose to look at the world every day makes a huge impact on everybody else that's around me. There's a lot of technical stuff. I mean, I mentioned data, uh, 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 leverage leadership. Holy moly, that book's fantastic when it comes to the data stuff. But if if you can't master the the art of being the leader, the science part of the leadership, it, it, it's difficult to ever get to. So, to me, it's to me it's energy bus. I could probably riff on ten or twelve others, but energy bus I think really helped to transform me. 
uh, you know, kind of in, in everything to do with my shift, my, my identification of the road to awesome, you know, going from the guy catching him doing it wrong to, hey, let's focus on, on the things you're doing right. Let's focus on how I'm going to show up every day. That, that came from John Gordon's energy bus. I love it. So I was given when I first were, when I received word that I got promoted to go into administration, my principal gave me what great principals do differently by Todd Whitaker. So you can see all the tabs that I have. These are very old tabs yeah. of, and I, I just happened to flip through it too, right before we got on, cause I saw the question and um, yeah, I've got everything highlighted, of course, you know, because oh, yeah. it's just such a profound book and you know, there's a reason why he's sold so many copies, but Todd Whitaker, um, uh, such a brilliant man. And, uh, I, you know, I had the great honor of, of interviewing him for aspire to lead, but you know, this book for me, it does a great job of just having, it's not, a, it's not a long read also. I'll, I'll say that it's, it's pretty thin, but you know, there's just a lot of questions in there that he asks that all new leaders, new principals, new assistant principals, we all wonder about. And it's so hard to transition from a teacher to an administrator and as, as much experience as you have in the classroom or even in the uh, administrative offices, if, if you've had a chance to, you know, do those different tasks, it's, you don't really know what the job's about. And there's so many different philosophies and, and decisions that need to be made um, and understood. And so, yeah, this book was phenomenal for myself. It was kind of a game changer and at least give me, gave me a little insight into the job before actually going over to that new campus. But yeah, that was probably one that was beneficial that I remember, you know, the principal handing over the, his desk uh, to me and uh, just consuming it immediately. Yeah. You know, it, I'm glad you brought that book up. Um, and, and it's funny to see you, you know, uh, where you know, most people aren't watching this, but um, to see you kind of pick that up and have all the tabs. And yeah. I will tell you that um, I have multiple copies, but the copy that I really lived in uh, we did it as a leadership uh, book study. Um, I hired two new assistant principals um, at a point in time. We did that. Josh, that copy is like falling apart. Like I, I, the things are just like stuffed back in because I've opened and closed and opened and closed so much that the binding is just gone on that book. It is truly an exceptional book when it comes to everything that uh, that we need to know and just the questions that we have. And, and you're right. Todd Whitaker is uh, just an incredible, incredible person. Somebody I've had an opportunity to have several conversations with. And um, he just, he wants, he wants every administrator to be successful. And that book is one that really takes us um, going in the right direction. So th there's a couple of really great recommendations there for books. We probably also could go on and on and on about books uh, here as well. But uh Let's do this. Um, are you ready to jump to the third question? Oh, of course. Let's do it. All right. Okay. So this one I love. And this one this one actually came from somebody who this year was a brand new superintendent. But it's an exceptional question, whether you're a brand new AP, brand new principal, or a brand new superintendent. Um, honestly, this is even great if you're a brand new teacher. But, you know, what are some tips for managing your time? Now, before before I let you start answering, I'm going to let you kind of ruminate on, on this yes, one for please. a second. Yeah. <laughs> so I got to say this. Um, myself, I've never been great at time management. I am not type A. Um, whatever the opposite is, whether that's type B or type Z, I'm that. Like, a hundred percent. I think like, I think we're the same on this one, buddy. I love this. This is going to be fun then. But... Uh, Man, I've I've had to pick up a lot of tips on on managing time, and uh, so much so that I, when I did my dissertation, just the struggles around the organizational management of the school versus the instructional leadership stuff, I, I switched um, late in the game my dissertation topic just to find out: Am I the only one who struggles with the organizational management stuff? I had the instructional leadership piece. I was good, but ooh, all that organizational management stuff it comes it comes to managing time. So I've given you a little bit of extra time to kind of think this one through. So um, we can go a couple directions with this if you want. If you want to just like list a bunch, or maybe we just kind of play a little bit of play a little bit of badminton here with yeah. with, with some Let's tips. Yeah. Okay. So it. go. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with my first tip is. I decided that during the school day, 
and my principal, one of my principals said this uh, beautifully is that as an administrator, it is like riding a bike, but you're on fire, the bike's on fire and everything around you is on fire. And it was so true. And I didn't know it at the time, but you know, that's, that's how administrative life is. And so if you have a to-do list that you think you're going to get done every single day, you are <laughs> right, <laughs> very mistaken. So, uh, what I decided, um, and this is one tip was to get into the building early prior to teachers really being in the building, because what I found was when I got there closer to when the school day began, I had a line already established at my door and I got zero tasks done. So Obviously, as administrators, we have a lot of documentation, a lot of things that need to get done clerically. And so I came in early, got those things done. That the Also, the benefit to that is that on the back end, right at the end of the day, I didn't have to stay as long as I would have. So I could go home to my family and see them, you know, when they were awake versus in the morning. I'm not really seeing them. They're getting ready for the day or they're, they're asleep. So I try to use that time um, to my benefit. And so time management, not only to be a better administrator, but then also to be a better father and to be a better husband. I like that. Um, I'll, I'll go with this one. And, and I've already talked about calendar, but this is another calendar tip. Um, be as proactive as you can be. So what I would do on Sundays, and sometimes I would even do this like Friday evening before I left the building, but usually it was on Sunday, block the things that you know you really want to make sure happen. So those things that are truly your priorities. You know, for me, school culture was always a huge priority. So I would put blocks of time for school culture. Um, I'll, I'll give you the tip about leveraging your secretary, unless you do it next, um, as my next tip. But um, she knew exactly what it meant when, when I had those things on my calendar. So that's where I'm going to spending time in classrooms with teachers when they don't have kids or you know, whatever the case may be. But the more that you can block what you need specifically accomplished on your calendar in advance, that will help you, number one, hold yourself to, oh, hey, I just, you know, had this event pop up on my calendar that says I have to check email. I always put email like 3.30 uh, on my calendar because it liberated me through the day. You know, like like if I know at 3.30 I'm going to be checking email, I'm good until then. I, I don't need to, you know, open my computer and look at an email or open my phone and look at an email, um, you know, when I'm in a classroom or, or wherever the case may be. That always kind of helped liberate me. So on Sunday afternoon, just start to put some blocks on your calendar that you know you want to have accomplished. Um, to me, I think that's huge. All right. I'm not going to steal your secretary one. Perfect. <laughs> but I do want to say, like, um, be careful with the open door policy. That's what I'll say. And, and being comfortable with closing your door. Um, because early as an administrator, I did want to be accessible, but I did it to a, to a degree that was detrimental to myself as an administrator. And time management went out the door because people just would show up. And that, you know, it was everybody. <laughs> it was students, uh, parents, and teachers coming into my door because it was open all the time. And, you know, I'd get into a task or, or something uh, that needed to be, you know, submitted, something that was due. And then I would have interruption after interruption, interruption. And then I would have to stay late because, you know, I had to get it done. It was due, right? So um, being comfortable with having your door closed, having a sign on the door, uh, letting them know, you know, I'm either in a meeting or, you know, that I'll be available at a certain time. And, you know, you're going to probably talk about this too, but, you know, having some folks in your corner also that can help establish that and turn folks away. Oh, yeah. Because even when those signs are on, people will knock on the door and, and want to interrupt. So, you know, being comfortable with that, it took me some time to understand that an open door policy is not always the best policy. I love that. And that's a trap I fell into. Um, so I'm glad you talked about that one. Um, so empowering your secretary is what I want to talk about next. I think this is so crucial. And, and it, it took me, you know, maybe a year or so to really understand the importance and the power of it. But once my secretary and I had developed a really good quality system, it wasn't just that she ran interference well, but it was also that she had full access to my email. And, you know, there's probably 60% of the emails I didn't need to see. 
So, you know, parent email, you know, I'm mad at, you know, such and such teacher. Well, she would reply as me, have you spoken to the teacher? The answer is no, she scheduled a medium for him, meeting for him. I didn't have to do that, you know, perfect. I trust her. I know she can do it. We have conversations every single morning. So if you empower your secretary, schedule 15 minutes every morning together so you can have a little touch base, that kind of thing. But it was huge. Um, it also helped me, like as I would go cruising down the hallways, you know, I'm headed to, you know, whatever classroom to, you know, to do an observation or I need to go meet with a teacher or I have an IEP meeting or wherever I'm going. You know this, when you're in the hallway, that accessibility that you just talked about, that open door thing, everybody wants to stop you. I'm sure it's, you know, hey, Josh, and he talked about this. Josh, you got two minutes. Hey, Josh, you got this. It was the yep. same thing for me. But Marilyn and I had a system where all I had to say was, hey, shoot Marilyn a quick email. Tell her what you need. Tell her how much time. She'll schedule it. I'll come to you. Poof. That was the system. And it was so amazing. I mean, what it also helped actually do, Josh, was before you knew it, people started realizing that they could solve their own problems. They didn't need me to solve every single problem. <laughs> that was great. Which is huge. <laughs> yeah. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love it. Um, yeah, the last thing, and this, this isn't so much managing time, but also managing mental health. I would say that you need to put some boundaries up in place, especially with email and being accessible when you're at home. So for myself, I did have a cutoff time that I would not respond to email. I would not respond to anyone really, um, because I was like, this is my time to be home, to be with my family. And I'm going to be intentional about that. And I think I just want to state that because I did not do that early in my career. Uh, where I was spending an insane amount of hours on the campus and away from my family. And I, I was sending emails 10, 10 30 at night. And it was just not a good situation where I was all, what I was telling my staff was I was telling them that you also need to work <laughs> insane hours. Exactly. You also need to communicate and not spend time with your family. And, um, you know, that was a culture piece that I think um, was not good for our campus. And, um, it wasn't good for me as a leader also, because I was getting burnt out. And then the next day, you know, I may have, you know, been extremely tired and irritable and <laughs> not very nice, uh, yeah. to folks. And so, you know, it's just like that snowball effect. So even with managing time, I think, you know, some of the things that we've already talked about, like if you can put those in place, I think you're going to set yourself for success at the end of the day where you really do need to be you know, away from the campus, not thinking about the craziness and the insanity that just occurred or what's going to be up ahead. Um, so, yeah, I, I just want to say that boundaries are a good thing for any leader, um, you know, with managing time. I think that's fantastic. Just one thing I'll, I'll say, yeah, it's kind of a yes and. Um, sure. And like you, I was not very good at modeling that. You know, I had my district phone, I had my personal phone, I had my laptop, I had my iPad. I mean, we had it all going all the time and uh, it's not good. It's not healthy. And, you know, I was able to take a couple of steps, that kind of thing. But something that that I will say that, it, you know, if you do feel like, you know, hey, Josh is saying, you know, you got to do, you know, you got to shut it down and this kind of stuff. That's true. But there may be those times where I was one who didn't sleep well at times. You know, I'd be up at 2.30 in the morning. And you know what? Nobody else is up. I'm drinking my coffee. I'm sitting in front of the fireplace. If you need to send email, go for it. But use schedule send. Because, yes. Josh, you hit it on the head. If you're sending an email at 2.30 in the morning, 10.30 at night, you are telling your staff, whether you mean to or not, that, hey, we are just go, go, go here. And mm -hmm. you know what? If I hit schedule send and it goes at 7.15, it looks like I sent it at 7.15, even if I did it at 2.30 in the morning. But... Yeah, those that's kind of that like, you know, underlying kind of, you know, subtle way of honoring their time because the email's not going to get to them too soon. So um, I, I love that you said that. OK, let's jump on to question number four. And this okay. one, man, I think this one's so interesting. And um, <laughs> I got to figure out how I want to phrase this one. Is this one my question to ask or yours? I can't remember. 
Oh, wait, no, it's yours. You've got to do this one. Is it my question? Yeah, well, no, that's I'm right. Just, I just I'm asked just the my managing time question. So let's see how yeah, you can I'm get through this one. Yeah, I'm going to skip over. I'm going to ask okay. another one. And you can, you can, because I, I'll, I'll come <laughs> I back to that one. Sure. As far as paraphrasing, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. And I think this goes with uh, managing time too, as far as kind of like the details of administration. So, what are best practices for documentation as an administrator and how detailed are these documents? <laughs> and I think this is so interesting. So I want to throw it your way because, well, one, I need to kind of remember kind of the, the progression yeah. of documentation through the years. I know, you know, things have changed slightly, but uh, for yourself, what yeah. were the best practices that you can think of? You know, I can think of three or four. Um, and this was another area that I had to really force myself as, you know, the the non-type A to be real intentional about about documentation. Um, forever, I've been a notebook guy. So, you know, I would have, you know, a handful of notebooks that were specific to, you know, type or individual or something like that. Eventually, I migrated that onto the computer. So, you know, anytime, you know, you have a conversation with an employee that, that's more than just a, hey, how you doing, you know, that kind of thing, the, the type that lends itself to potentially being employee discipline. Um, when you get back to your office or, you know, when you're at a place where, where you can sit down for a couple of minutes, jot down your notes so it's fresh in your mind and then send a follow up email just as a, you know, hey, thanks for having this conversation with me. You know, here's just a you know quick bullet point, you know, of what we talked about and what was, you know, really agreed upon or even if it's not agreed upon, this is the directive you know, from that conversation. I think that's really big to, to do that. Uh, something that I learned later in my career, I wish I'd learned it a lot earlier, um, is, is this, once you go into writing, stay in writing. Um, you know, there, there are those times where we're going to have those conversations that are, you know, if you want to call it a verbal warning or a verbal redirect or whatever. But once we, in a particular realm with a particular employee, have gone to the point where, you know, it's an informal write-up or a memorandum to file or whatever phrasing, you know, your particular organization uses, once you go into writing, you need to stay there. Because at that point, it's beginning to build documentation of a pattern of behavior. So to me, those are the two that jump out the most. Um, and I guess the third one, <sighs> I, our attorney, uh, when I was a principal, I heard him say this more times than I care to admit to. Um, but if it's not in writing, it didn't happen. So yeah, documentation is critical. It really is. And whether you're good at it or not, you'll continue to get better and get better. And I, I've seen some things, you know, since, even since leaving my superintendency, tendencies I have in documentation where I'm like, wow, I ended up getting really good at that. <laughs> well, unfortunately you have to, I mean, right. and that's, I think you, you said it too. Uh, I w wish I learned this early on in, in my career, but it was through mistakes and people, either a secondary director or a lawyer saying, do you have X, Y, and Z? And you're like, oh shoot, was I supposed to? <laughs> like, so, right. you know, it was um, one of those learning through fire, uh, and trial through fire and just learning that practice of, yeah, I had a notebook to start off with. And then I realized, okay, it's easier to do it, you know, digitally and I can start creating electronic folders and, you know, and then, you know, Google suite comes in and then I can, you know, have my Google uh, folders there where I have, you know, if it's a parent, if it's a student, if it's a, a staff member, like whatever it is that I can have um, this documentation. And, you know, unfortunately with a lot of those conversations, those tough, uncomfortable, you know, meetings, I did have my laptop there and sometimes I would slide over or like slide it over and just start taking notes. And I had to do the same process of sending a, a email afterwards and just letting them know of what things were covered. And that way we both were on the same page as to what the conversation was. And, you know, that way they also knew that, you know, if I had the laptop there and I was taking notes that it was more official than just a, a common conversation. So um, I wanted them 
you know, if there was, you know, some high emotions to understand that <laughs> they need to calm down a little bit um, because it was going to be documented as far as what was being said. And that's unfortunate, but that's the reality of things um, as far as administration. So uh, making sure that, you know, if you weren't having those notes taken during the middle of the conversation um, electronically, and if you're using a notebook that I had to transfer that immediately um, over to the computer. So as soon as the meeting was done, I didn't go into another task. I didn't leave my office. You know, that's shutting the door getting those notes where they needed to go. Um, if it's student discipline, like after that was done, after you call the parent, like whatever program I was in, you know, for ours, thankfully we had a note section. I would just start filling the notes out and letting them know exactly what happened. Or, you know, if a teacher sent an email to give more information immediately doing that, because what would happen was I'd get a stack of, you know, discipline referrals or, you know, all these different meetings that I hadn't done notes on. And then, you know, talking about that time management piece, <laughs> it's not getting done during yeah. the day. So, you know, now I'm having to schedule, you know, a two, three hour block of time somewhere to then catch up on documentation. So um, in addition to making sure that you have those notes either during the meeting or after the meeting, make sure that you're doing it immediately so it doesn't stack up. Um, and you also forget important details that need to be within that documentation. Yeah, I think that's huge right there. You know, the the closer to the time that it happens, the the more efficient you're going to be uh, and the more accurate your memory is going to be. Um, you know, something that you said in there, too, kind of kind of made a couple other things come to mind. Um, you know, when when you do exactly what you're talking about, and I, I would do it, too, where you're taking notes, you know, right there on your laptop often and I'm, I'm a little more focused on the employee discipline stuff than, than with the, the student discipline piece, which, which is good. You've talked about student discipline on the employee side. You know, there's there's a you know, pretty good opportunity or a good likelihood that if you are, you know, doing, you know, or working with some employee discipline, that there may be a union representative or something like that in the room, which, which gives me two thoughts. Number one is um, taking those notes um, really, really efficient thing and a great way to be transparent. Um, I've, I've had, un, you know, union reps ask, can I have a copy of your notes? Of course, you know, there's no problem with that. But sure. And here's the other piece I want to add to that when it comes to documentation, especially when it gets to to a point where it can be pretty emotional, could potentially be leading toward a recommendation for non-renewal or something along those lines, mm -hmm. um, there is nothing that says you can't also have representation in the room. Not necessarily meaning somebody there's a rep, but rather a second set of eyes. Um, I did yep. that several times in those really like what are leading to tense, tense moments. I think the first couple of times that I non-renewed teachers, I would, I would have somebody else in the room and, you know, it's a, another administrator. Typically one of my assistant principals would sit in with me and that's just simply, you know what, we want to make sure that we're accurate. We want to make sure that we're documenting everything correctly and that our memories are, are accurate if, if it ever comes to pass. And that works well, I think in helping your union representation understand that you're taking this very seriously. This isn't just you coming out of left field. No, I love that. I love what you just said, because I do that often, too, because if it's just a one on one meeting, you know, it's their word against yours. And so, you know, it, it was really beneficial to have a third person in there just to be someone that, you know, saw and heard what was going on in that meeting. Um, so that, you know, if someone claimed that something was done or said that didn't actually occur in the meeting, I had, you know, someone else. Um, and a lot of times yeah. I would have them take the notes. So it was a so I could be very intentional about the conversation and what was going on in that meeting and not so much distracted with notes. So, um, no, that's a great point. I love that you yeah. said that. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So we'll come back to that question that uh, I tried to give to you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, not, I wasn't trying to get rid of it. I really wasn't. This is just, it's such a great question. It's just really, really yeah. deep. Um, and really what this is about is all the things that go on behind 
the closed door of the principal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, schools are, I've, I've said it for a long time, and I'm not the first person to think it or say it, schools are a microcosm of your community. And in your community, you have moments of grief and sadness and loss, uh, new beginnings and celebrations and everything in between. And so often as the principal, my wife would jokingly say I was the mayor of Rock Springs High School. Um, you, you get to be a part of so many of those moments, good, bad, mm -hmm. and just kind of in between. So as a principal, let's talk about those key moments and how important your full presence is to those moments and the lasting impact that that will have on you as a leader, but then also on your school community. Yeah. No, I, I think this is beautifully written as far as, I mean, there's like a paragraph here. So you did a fantastic yeah. job of kind of giving a synopsis, but I think it hits on all those different emotions, right? Of, And I heard this from a lot of aspiring leaders that would come in, they would shadow us. And then at the end of the day, you could just see like, them trying to process just all of the different experiences and emotions that occurred within the principal's office. And they would always say, I just didn't understand <laughs> what all happened back here, you know, in the front office and of course in the principal's office. And so, yeah, behind closed doors, um, you know, because we do, we, you are like a mayor, you, you know, if there's a, a death to a family member, you know, I, I could vividly remember a couple of situations where the families would come in and they just came in just, you know, grieving and in tears and not knowing, you know, the next steps in life. And, you know, you have to be the counselor in that, in that situation and trying to help them through that. And also, you know, trying to find resources for the kid that's attending your school and understanding that this huge loss is going to affect them in the classroom. And what are we going to put in place to make sure that they're successful in this time of grieving? And, um, but then also being there for the family and, then you, you've got, you know, great joys of, you know, people getting married and having kids and, you know, like you, you get all these other additional things that are well beyond the four walls, but also affect what happens with the culture of the school, you know, and you want to be there to, to be the, the biggest cheerleader too. And, and to, you know, find ways to, you know, shout on the mountaintop of like how excited you are for them or being proud of them. So, you know, it's, it's such these high spectrums <laughs> that you see. Um, but I will say that, you know, behind closed doors, that it also needs to be a safe space. So, you know, as an administrator, life is difficult. And you unfortunately get yelled at, cussed at, called every name in the book. And you go through some really uncomfortable meetings and conversations. And you do need a safe space to go behind closed doors and to be able to have a counseling session with your own crew, right? Um, you know, thankfully I've, I've always been able to have this like wonderful relationship with the administrative staff um, on my campus and to be able to, to go in and ask for advice or, you know, spitball, like, did I do this all right? Or did, well, am I in the wrong here? <laughs> Cause sometimes you start right. to question that after you get yelled at and uh, called every name. So, yeah. um, you know, having that safe space of like trying to work things out because a lot of times, and you know this too, Darren, like, every day seems like a brand new experience that you've never had before, even though you've been in the position for 10 years and you're like, am, am I crazy here? You know, can I just bounce this, bounce this off to you? Or maybe you're about to prepare for a meeting, shut the door and have these, these crucial conversations of like, how do I prepare to make sure that this runs as smooth as possible? So yeah, I think, you know, with those mixed emotions that were listed, I think it's not only, yes, you're doing that with your staff and with your community, but you're also having to do that with your own core administrative staff. Right. Yeah. I, that I'm glad you said that everything you just said was, was exceptional. And I, I just want to build on what you were just saying yeah. about Please. when, you know, having those behind closed doors moments with your, with your core team. And, you know, it took me right to, um, one particular incident uh, that uh, that we had, I think, fairly early in my principalship, maybe my first year, maybe my second. But um, uh, it was it wasn't good. Um, we we had received a, a pretty significant threat um, against um, a handful of our schools, and you know it's it's in those moments, 
You know, I, I talk all the time, Josh, about, you know, leading from the front, leading from the middle and leading from the back. And obviously the preferred positions are middle and back, but there are moments where you have to lead from the front. And, you know, that particular incident, I'll never forget, you know, bringing my team, you know, into the office and just saying, all right, look, here's what we have. And being able to have that trust within the team so that we all were able to collectively, okay, we need to make sure we do this. We need to make sure we do this. We know we have this in our crisis plan, but this is a little bit unique. What else might we need to do here, here, and here? It's some of those things behind closed doors um, that I think also are really critical. Um, That incident, mercifully, nothing negative happened. Evacuating our students went as about as beautifully as we could have ever hoped for it to go, um, you know, and late in the day, you know, everybody's leaving, the last of the kids are gone. And, and I told the staff that, you know, they needed to leave the building, but I still had, in addition to my, my team, six or seven staff members who stayed. And, you know, some told me, some told other members of the leadership team that, you know, just simply because of how you guys led us today, we didn't want to leave you. And, you know, when when you have those moments behind closed doors, those are the moments that then translate out, looping it all the way back to the beginning with relationships and expectations and trust. Um, there's just so many things, Josh, that happen behind closed doors. And you know, you and I both preach, be out, be available, you know, but yeah. there are going to be those moments, anything like you said, from, you know, you know, a, a tragic loss in the community to, you know, to, to some great news to, to all other things in between. Um, I guess I would say this, really stay present in those moments, um, not only because you need to be that great active listener, uh, because you're going to be called on to be the great active leader <laughs> at a point from what you're learning. Um, but also hang on to those, hang on to those moments, because whether it's a, it's a difficult moment, uh, a, you know, a challenging moment, a celebration, whatever it is, those are the things that you, as, as the early career leader, you need to, you need to bank those things and be able to lean into them because, you know, that's going to build you and build your character and build your confidence as a leader. I wouldn't wish anybody that situation that I led my team through that day, but I know it made me a heck of a lot better leader. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I think, you know, being being the leader that people are comfortable behind the closed door with you, right, is I can, I can think of countless opportunities where teachers came in, shut the door, and then just laid a bomb on my desk as far as, you know what, my spouse just lost their job, or I'm going through a really horrendous divorce, or, you know, fill in the blank of what what was going on in their life. And a lot of times, I didn't even know it was occurring. You know, they put on the brave yeah. face, they were great with the kids, they were, you know, phenomenal with their instruction, and kids were mastering whatever subject they were teaching. But, you know, for them to feel comfortable enough to to come in and to let us know what was really going on behind the scenes is huge. And I think, you know, as a aspiring leader or someone that's early in their stage, like that's that's the goal. You want to make sure that they are comfortable with sharing whatever's going on in their life, uh, good or bad, and that, you know, they're willing to close that door and, you know, share that with you and, and know that you're there to help them through what it, whatever it is they're going through, good or bad. I love it, man. That's that was that was five really good, really in depth <laughs> questions, and uh, you know I know we could we could probably hit ten or twenty more, but we've already consumed quite a bit of time for one episode. Uh, let's l- let's do this. I'm going to ask you just one quick question, um, and then cool. you can ask one quick one of me. Um, school year's getting ready to start. I'm a brand new leader. One thing, just tell me one thing. If you can do this, this is going to help you be successful. Find your mentor. I think you need to find someone that, and this could be in your building, it could be somewhere in the district, it could be somewhere across the world, it doesn't really matter, but finding that person that you feel comfortable with asking questions, bouncing ideas off of, getting you know advice, um, that was always huge. I still to this day, even though I'm not in a building right now, I still have mentors. I have multiple mentors for different areas of my life. So I would just say like, you know, keep trying to learn, 
but you can't do this by yourself. You can't do it, especially early on in your career. Um, you're going to make mistake after mistake after mistake. Everyone does. It's it's part of the journey. But you know, if you're going to try and do it alone, um, it's going to be really an uphill battle for you. So find your mentor, find someone that you trust, that you aspire to be someday, uh, that you you know respect. And that's going to give you feedback that is going to make you better. You don't want a yes, man, uh, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. You want someone that's going to, you know, actually feed critical feedback to you. That's going to make you a better administrator. So I'm going to flip it to you, Darren, because I, I know you've got, I can see your world's turn, turning also on this question. So uh, yeah. is there something that you would advise also? I would just say, get some clarity. Just get clear about what you really care about. You know, there's, I would have gone with the don't try to be Superman, but you, you already went there, which is super. Um, I, I would just say, find some clarity, you know, again, be really clear about what you care about. And I'm not talking about a laundry list of a hundred things. I'm, I mean, like for me, it was six. What are the six things that you really think matter? And then make sure somebody knows what those are. And then have a system for checking in on yourself. For me, I would actually go stand on the balcony above my gymnasium. And like in my own mind, I could see those six things on the floor. And I did that about every three or four weeks. Occasionally, my secretary would put it on my calendar and she'd say, get over there. You need to go get refocused. But it's so easy to get lost in the weeds. It's so easy to just like, there's so much to do. Get clear about what you care about and make sure you're checking in on yourself regularly. Don't let yourself get lost in the job. It's an amazing job, but you can get lost in it real fast. I love it. Well, for those who are listening, if you're a young leader, hey, maybe you're a current leader, you're, you're, you're a veteran, but you need support in any way, obviously, you can reach out to the both of us on social media, email, you know, on our website, there's contact forms. You can you can reach us that way too. So we are here to help in any way possible. Obviously, we only touched on the five or six questions, but I know there's probably about a thousand oh, more yeah. out there from our <laughs> listeners. So if you have something that we can support you in, please reach out. Darren and I are we we do have the open door policy for y'all, and so that's right. We uh, do. make sure that you are contacting us and and letting us know how we can support you. Darren, do you have any other things that you want to bring up to the listeners? No, I, th I think you've really hit it well there. Um, you know, back to what Josh said, find a mentor. You know, if, if you don't have somebody there in your district or in your school or something like that, then reach out to one of us or somebody else yes. that, that you find that you really trust. Because, man, Josh, you said it so well. You can't do the job alone. You just can't. So, yeah, lean into those that are out there around you and uh, reach out. We'd love to talk to both of you. Thank you for listening in to this episode on both the Leaning Into Leadership podcast and Aspire to Lead. Right on.